So we we had the evangelism seminar with David and uh, with Aaron. And if you want the video, order the. You can go online and order the video. Otherwise, all we're going to have on the website is the audio. And um, I don't know how sufficient that will be. I did not get to make most of it because of other commitments and things. So that's anyway. That's it. One more thing about Israel. I have been on at least six or seven calls in the last couple of three days listening to different things. I went to an event last night showing solidarity for Israel at, at uh, Beth Yashurn, which is over there on Beech Nut. It's the largest conservative synagogue in the U.S., and there were probably about 1,500 people there. Ted Cruz was there, and other people whose names I don't like to mention were there because they're an embarrassment to the city, but they were all there. And everybody, everybody is has getting the same memo who's, who's out, out of Israel or related, and that is that, that this is going to be a long war, and we, right now, everybody is backing Israel. Everybody is ta- saying the right things because they see the video. They see what Hamas did. They see what's happened in the uh, Kibbutzim. But we all know that the news cycle is rather short, 21 days, and we know that the attention span of Americans isn't probably just about that long, and they'll start to forget about it. Also, they'll start to see a lot of things posted by Hamas about all of the, what, all the people, whether they're made up. I've seen videos that got out of uh, Gaza where they're making up the kids, their blood and everything, to make them look like they've, they've been seriously injured when they have it. I mean, it's just horrendous. They, they, you can't believe a word they say. And so uh, it's going to get bad because once they start showing pictures of children maimed and all of these other things, then people are going to start putting pressure on Israel to back off. And Israel at this point is articulating their goal, which is to completely dismantle and remove Hamas from Gaza com- totally, completely. What can you do about that? Number one, you need to call your congressman, you need to call your senators, and just thank them for their support. Uh, they're all very, very supportive. They always have been. Uh, some of you may live in districts where uh, you may have a a uh, 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 Democrat representative, but most of the ones around here are at least, you know, much as I hate to say it, what's her name over there is running for mayor, is always high on the list because she always votes right, but my suspicion is she probably trades her vote with somebody else so that she always looks good, and um, she's that's her forte, but anyway, we need to call them and thank them for their support, and on the other hand, we need to Uh, When things start to slip, we need to continue to call them and tell them to uh, stay the course. I have been told this by congressman after congressman after congressman. They get 1,000, 1,500 uh, emails or letters of hate, don't do what you're doing, all of that, and they get one or two attaboys. And so they need the attaboys, and they need people calling them and saying, thanks for doing what you're doing, stay the course. So that's the message I'm getting from all the, all across the board. All right, pray for pray for uh, David Halevi as he's headed back to his family. He leaves out supposedly uh, Thursday night at 9 p.m. Pray for Jesse. Pray for the kids. Pray for the people we know. Uh, they're all doing fine, but but uh, I noticed today that there were some rockets that were shot down that were headed for Tel Aviv. There's more of a threat there and Jerusalem, so just, just be in prayer for them as well as our, our other missionaries. So um, let's have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful that we had the great weekend that we had with the different uh, speakers and also with just focusing on some very important uh, topics Sunday as well. Uh, Father, we just pray that you might strengthen our convictions of the truth of your word and our mission. 
Uh, things may get really rough in the next few years. E economically, this war could easily expand and, um, and, and spread. We have no idea, but we need to uh, have our spiritual powder dry. We need to be ready for everything and pre be prepared and not take our biblical study and biblical focus lightly. So, Father, we pray that you'd continue to challenge us, and especially as we study uh, the interlocked material, the tremendous need to train our children to think biblically and to train ourselves to think more biblically. And we pray that that will be accomplished. And we just pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, it's been a couple of weeks. We're going through the second part of Lesson 6. And the basic idea here is the re uh, reinstalled divine institutions following the Noahic flood. Uh, there, the three divine institutions that we've seen are uh, responsible choice, marriage, and family. And they are going to be reintroduced along with a fourth divine institution. So we have our timeline here. We haven't done this in a couple of weeks. We've all probably forgotten it, so let's all stand up. And um, we have one of, our, one of our listeners, Martin, who was here with the kids this summer, has, a, has found some good, um, good images to put up here. And so we have this. Uh, he's kind of enhanced this a little bit. And I'm going to have him do something else. We're going to take kingdom and split it. So we have one king, United Kingdom, and then we'll split it with a double, a double crown for the double kingdom. So we'll just start with this. We have the creation, then the fall, flood, Tower of Babel, then we have the call of Abraham, that is followed by the Exodus, and then the giving of the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law. Then we have the conquest. Following the conquest, you have the establishment of the kingdom. Now the kingdom's going to split and divide, and that will lead to the uh, second kingdom, and eventually they will be taken out of the land. So we have our, they both go out. And then there's just a partial return, one coming back. And then that is the end of the Old Testament. Then we get to the New Testament, and we have the birth of Jesus. And then he's going to die on the cross. Then he's going to be buried. Then he will rise from the dead. And then 40 days after, he ascends to heaven. Ten days later, he sends the Holy Spirit at the, on the day of Pentecost, and that establishes the church. And then the end of the church age, Jesus comes back in the air, and we're taken to heaven uh, to be with him. On the earth, there's the seven-year tribulation. That's depicted up here by the four horsemen, the four horsemen of the apocalypse at the beginning of chapter 6. So you have the uh, tribulation, and then the second coming, Christ comes to the earth and establishes kingdom for a thousand years, and then the great white throne judgment. All right, you did pretty good. Think your way through the Bible. Incidentally, I'm working on doing about a, f I'm hoping I can keep it to about 40 minutes, but just a, what I'm going to call a run through the Old Testament. There's so many people who when they start to read the Old Testament, they don't have any idea how it fits together. What's going on here? I don't know any of these names. They're hard to pronounce. I don't know these places, all of that. So you just have to get that, like the, like the picture puzzle or jigsaw puzzle, you have to have that picture of how all the pieces fit together so that when you're reading, you can have a way to orient to that, that whole message. So what we saw was in the creation, we emphasize the creator-creature distinction, that man is created in the image of God to represent him as ruler over the earth and the first three divine institutions. At the fall, we saw that man wanted to be God. He wanted to be independent of God, and, and the creator-creature distinction was uh, erased. Uh, they wanted to erase it. And the penalty for sin was spiritual separation from God to eternity in the lake of fire. Uh, it affected all of the divine institutions as well as all of the physical laws in the universe. And it's important to recognize because God is omniscient and omnipotent. He was able to create everything knowing what sin would do. 
that everything in the universe could handle the chaos that would come as a result of sin. At the flood, it was caused because of human evil, which knew no limits. The evil in man's imagination was uh, beyond, uh, beyond any limits. It also uh, increased, increased because of the fallen angel incursion. So God flooded the entire earth and he killed all of the people and all of the, land, all of the animals that breathed air, not the fish. And then when uh, Noah and his family got off the ark a year and a week later, God established a covenant with them uh, called in the, in, the, uh, in the curriculum New World Covenant, but it's the Noahic, Noahic covenant or the covenant with Noah. So after the flood, we see the party, we've studied this in the previous lesson, the parties in the New World Covenant in the Noahic covenant, there's God is the uh, party of the first part, and all of the all of mankind, all of the animals, all of the uh, breathing air breathing animals are uh, part of the covenant. He makes the covenant with all of them, and then it is signed. And the signature of the covenant is the rainbow. That is God's sign of His promise. And the covenant, which emphasizes capital punishment, which becomes the basis for human government. Also, that man is now to eat meat. And then, uh, lastly, that God promises that he will never again destroy the earth by water. Uh, so, the, we get a question that comes up then that isn't the uh, rainbow, a symbol of gay rights. So, we, um, we haven't talked about that. Or did we talk about that? We didn't, did we talk about that? We'll get back to that. The legal terms of the New World Covenant. We talked about that, and this is where we stopped. So we did get through the rainbow and gay rights. Uh, is there really a God? Isn't what we see in nature just natural law? And we talked about that. That's about where we stopped. And so tonight we're going to finish up with the reinstalled divine institutions. Of res we have responsible choice. And as part of that, the, there is the issue of is it cruel to Eat, kill and eat animals. This is a big question today because of uh, veganism and vegetarianism and is being a vegetarian really better? Uh, second divine institution of marriage uh, continues and then there'll be the new divine institution of human government. So that's our review. So we have the reinstalled divine institutions and then the new fourth divine institution and the question there that people raise is, would a loving and forgiving God actually install capital punishment? Isn't capital punishment something believers should fight against as it is barbaric, unnecessary, and unjust? So we will look at that and then a summary of the divine institutions. Just as a comment there, when I was in the seventh grade, we had to pick a topic and write our first thesis. Remember when you learned about writing a, 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 a thesis statement and a short paper uh, developing the thesis statement? Mine was on capital punishment. And so the teacher made a comment on there. Well, she said, God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And I didn't know how to answer that, but I went home and I talked to my parents uh, rather than being like a, a, a really dumb kid and saying, well, I guess you're right. Uh, I went home and talked to my parents and they say, well, God delegates. And so that vengeance is accomplished. And the word for vengeance really doesn't describe a personal vendetta motivated by personal hatred. It is a word related to justice, bringing about justice. And so that is, uh, comp God accomplishes that through the means, uh, intermediate means of government. So we have, um, uh, we've got, covered that, summarized the new uh, world covenant. The parties were God, mankind, and the animals, the signatories, God alone. Uh, is the one who uh, binds himself to the covenant with his signature rainbow. The promise is no future floods. Uh, also, new situation, eat, eating meat, and also uh, capital punishment delegation of judicial responsibility. 
It is an unconditional covenant that is still in effect, and we see this on the timeline. It went into effect following the flood, and it is in effect until the final judgment, the great white throne judgment, and Revelation at the end of Revelation chapter 20. So last time we were talking about, well, while the earth remains, um, God is regulating. He's in control of the environment. The environment does not just operate autonomously, but God is in control, and so there's regularity, God's, and that gives stability and certainty in creation. And we can depend upon that, and so we follow that. So that led to the question about this time was when we stopped, is there really of God? So you have a worldview that is called naturalism, and naturalism is the worldview that there is no God and there's no supernatural beings that have anything to do with mankind, that everything that is going on is visible to us. And we have enough brains to where we can ultimately figure everything out. So it is a product of of arrogance, but it is a complete rejection of God's plan and purpose. But Scripture teaches us, Hebrews 1.3, that God upholds all things by the word of His power. In Colossians 1.15-17, we read that, um, <coughs> For by Him, meaning Christ, all things were created in the heavens and on the earth. All things were created through Him and for Him. He's before all, all things, and in Him all things consist. So everything is under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Matthew chapter 5, in the midst of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, I'm not the Sermon on the Mount, yeah, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that uh, you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust, and sends serious heat to Texas on the just and the unjust. Just thought I would add that. Isn't it great to have cool weather and be past that summer stuff? So God makes his promise. He says, I'm sustaining the world and everything in it. Now, even if we are excessively irresponsible, God has built into his creation uh, the things that can clean it up. And we continue to discover Uh, that there are certain things that are available to us. One of the things that we see today that is a problem is is plastic. And so um, when I was, I remember back in the 70s thinking, well, I think plastic is worse than, than paper, so why are we going from paper to save the rainforest and 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 the plastic's worse? Well, apparently today that science... See, God builds things in there whether we know it or not. Science has discovered that there are certain microbes that can eat plastic. And so that can solve uh, that can solve part of that problem. And there are a lot of things like that that do go on. So God sustains the world and everything in it, and we see cycles of climate. And so when we go through I remember back in 2011, we had that big drought, and the Lake Travis on the other side of Austin dropped about 80 to 90 feet. And Tommy, uh, Tommy's son was over there, I think, one of his sons. And Tommy goes back to Austin a lot, and he, he, he said, those kids at University of Texas are all whining and crying and moaning about the fact that, that, that Lake Travis is gone, and how will they survive and everything else? And we would laugh because we've seen it, this happen at least three or four times in our life. I remember as a kid in the upper part of Lake Travis walking across it without getting my feet wet a couple of times when I was a kid. So these things always change, and it was probably about four or five years later that Lake Travis was uh, flooding over its banks. So these, these kinds of things always happen. But when you base your views on, every, on everything scientific, on uniformitarianism, that the processes that, that we see today are always the same in the past, then you project those into the future, and you have all kinds of different problems. Some of you are not old enough to remember this, but this is a Time magazine cover uh, from 1973, because there was the prediction of a big freeze. 
that was going to come. Now I'm going to shift over here and pull up something I wanted to want to show you from last time. The links to these things that I'm going to show you are are going to be put up. Oh, I sent those to Barb earlier. They'll be put up on the website. But here is an article. I need to move this over to there. This is an article that came out in uh, about the I, the when the history when the Thames River in London froze over, the Little Ice Age. And they had frost fairs on the Thames. It was so thick that uh, uh, Princess Elizabeth I would go out there with her friends and they would have archery practice. And that because you had people who, who lived on both sides of the Thames, you had shopkeepers and, and farmers on the other side. They would just uh, get their carriages or their wagons and they would go across uh, the river they, rather than... Um, uh, go with a with a uh, uh, some sort of cab or some other means of transportation. According to this article, roughly between 1300 and 1850, so that's 550 years. These cycles are long. The world experienced this little ice age where there was significant cooling in global temperatures. Temperatures and the effects varied from region to region and year to year, but there were three significant intervals of particular cold around 1650, around 1770, think that in the, Revol in the American War for Independence era, and 1850. In England, this resulted in particularly cold winters. That's why we have these ver Victorian images of winter and cold and Christmas and Santa Claus. Uh, think about Charles Dickens and Scrooge. It's right in the midst of this, these extremely cold periods. Um, and uh, according the article says, however, between 1400 and 1835, this also resulted in at least 24 winters where the river Thames froze over, which led to merriment for all. And there were numerous factors contributed to this. It goes on and talks about that. Has a picture here of people out on the river. At that time, they didn't have the high banks, so the river was actually wider and shallower, which was one reason it, it would freeze over. Here's a picture of the great frost uh, parties that they would have out there. And so it was a time, uh, 1536, Henry VIII slayed along the river from central London to Greenwich. 1564, Elizabeth used the frozen river for archery. Children would go out on the river and play football. In the 17th century, the river froze over more often and for longer. So all of this is what was going on for 550 years. Then uh, another thing that we see is in this article, what we, what we see is that people are saying, can I move that up? No, I can't. Uh, people are saying, science proves that kids are bad for the earth. Morality suggests that we stop having them. This is recent, all on the basis of the man's arrogance that he thinks he can predict what will come in the future. And the French nationals are, say that going child, they must go child-free in order to save the planet. Of course, it'll destroy their nation. And then you have this article by a woman, professor wrote the A Human manifest, uh, Manifesto, and so her solution is that the worst thing you can do is to have a child. So you ought to go read some of the comments that are put up on some of these articles. And then this was another example of the early 70s. The headline says it all in the New York Times, climate change it changes endanger world's food output. I remember that when I was in high school. You're, some of you remember that in the early 70s that we're going to have mass famine around the world uh, by 1975. Some of us look like we could stand a mass famine. All right. So we have to recognize that there are some serious problems with empiricism. 
because there's always something new that can happen the next week, some new piece of data that completely changes, changes the, whole, the whole model. So now we come to the reinstalled divine institutions. The divine institutions, as we have said, are a responsible choice. I needed to change that, but did not. A responsible choice, marriage, and family. Uh, a responsible choice is still there, but it's perverted. There's problems because we're born sinners with an orientation toward rebellion against God. We're spiritually dead. Marriage turns into a rivalry and a battle between the sexes. Uh, family breaks down. Uh, everybody has some sort of dysfunctional family because everybody has dysfunctional people in it. So if everybody's dysfunctional, the word dysfunctional doesn't mean anything anymore. We're sinners. That's a better word. So under the first divine institution, which is responsible choice, we see what, that God established this choice in the garden, that man could eat from any tree that he chose except one was prohibited, and that was the tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil. And so as a result of that, God provided food, and the food was all related to... Food's all, all related to um, being vegetarian. They were designed to eat from the fruit of the tree, and there's no authorization to eat meat, because that would bring death, wouldn't it? You're going to have to kill some animal to, in its perfect environment, so there's no death. So uh, that was the, the circumstance, and so uh, nobody ate meat. Now, when we come to the Noahic covenant, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. So he reiterates that same initial uh, command. And the fear of you, the dread of you will be on every beast of the earth. See, there wasn't that fear of man prior to this covenant. So there's a shift in the relationship of humans with animals. And it involves the beast of the earth, the bird of the air, and all that moves on the earth and all the fish of the sea. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Now, there's some people who are trying to make, you know, they're going after crickets, but I don't think that's something that, 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 that we need to, in Texas, we're not concerned with that. We have better forms of protein. Uh, but there's a prohibition. You shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. From the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require it. So that this is a divine law. And in order for man to fulfill it, there has to be a structure to apply the, the, the death penalty. And that's important. We recognize in everything that we've seen that God is an orderly God and God has a structure. God is also omniscient, so he knew that man would apply it in unjust ways. So we can't fall back on and say, well, you know, it's never applied justly, so, so maybe we ought not do it. Because that's saying that, well, God made a mistake because he didn't really take into account that we wouldn't do it right. God in his omniscience knew we wouldn't do it right. And so God recognized that even with all of the problems that would come with an uneven or unjust application of the death penalty, it was better to have it than to not have it. And so when somebody comes along and says, no, 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 I don't believe that. Well, oh, who made you God? Do you know enough to make that decision? We're going to see this same issue with internationalism at the uh, Tower of Babel, where God decided it would be better to divide everybody up by language and have many different nations, which would bring about all kinds of territorial conflicts and wars and rumors of wars and all kinds of horrible things. In his omniscience, he knew that not dividing mankind up would be worse. So we always have to recognize that, that God, more than 99.9% .9 of the time, God knows better than we do. All right, so um, 
what we see is that there is a, another issue here that comes up, and that is the death of animals as sacrifices. And that is a foreshadowing of the sacrificial death that Christ would have on the cross, that he would die in our place. So the question comes up today, especially in our, in our culture, where people are being told that it's better to uh, not eat meat. And it's better to, then we don't have to raise animals for eating. And then because they have all kinds of gaseous problems that's changing the environment. See how all of these things fit together logically with, on the basis of their presuppositions that we know better and we can control the environment uh, better, better than God. So God tells us that he gave us meat for food, and Satan says, don't eat meat. This is a pagan worldview. Don't eat, don't eat meat. Now, does that mean that every Christian should eat meat? No, not necessarily. There may be very personal reasons why you should not eat very much animal protein. It may have something to do with your digestion. It may have something to do uh, with budgetary factors. There could be a number of reasons, but, but it should not be a philosophical decision. It should not be a decision based upon a, a religious or philosophical conviction that somehow there is something morally wrong with it for God, God has authorized it. And we have passages that warn us about this, for example, in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, where Timothy writes, now the, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, now that's an important phrase here because you have the latter times or the last days of Israel, and you have the latter times of the church age. And uh, we are in those last days of the church age ever since the first century because we don't know when they're going to end. Uh, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So what follows are doctrines of demons. We often think in extremes, but... Uh, doctrines of demons, these speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. They can't tell right from wrong anymore. And we have too many people elected to leadership positions, both in business and in government, that have lost their moral compass. It's all about money. It's all about wealth and material things. And another part of this, forbidding to marry, and notice, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Verse 4, for every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now some people will raise the question about eating meat. And they ask, well, what about eating rare meat? What about eating really bloody rare meat? What about eating medium rare meat? Don't we have to cook it all? Well, the red juices that come out of a steak or a roast or a lamb chop are not blood. The blood has been drained. Blood is hemoglobin. This is myoglobin. Myoglobin uh, has uh, the same color of the red, red meat, but it has a different function. It is not blood. So we're not eating blood when you're, when you're eating anything that has the red liquid there. So when you look at a piece of meat and you say, oh, I don't want to eat that bloody meat. It's too bloody for me. You're, you don't understand. It's not bloody at all. It's better when it's rare, especially if it's prime rib or lamb chops. I, I've always been known, just run it through a warm kitchen and it's good enough for Robbie. All right. So the real issue 
in all of these kinds of decisions comes down to be what? It comes down to be the character of the individual. It comes down to be spiritual maturity and understanding God's plan and, and God's role. And the problem that we often see with kids, and this is a good verse for parents to be reminded of in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, uh, Paul writes, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. And that is so important for parents to watch over your kids and who their friends are. And I've told you this many times, and it bothered me when I was a kid, but my mother made sure every time I would come home, starting when I was little, first grade, second grade, I remember one of my longtime childhood friends uh, I met in the second grade, and he lived uh, the block down from me. And I came home and told my mother about him, and she said, is he a believer? Has he trusted Christ as his Savior? And I thought, well, I don't know. And she said, well, you need to find out. So I found out the next day. And then whenever I would come home with a new friend, I always got that question. So by the time I got to where I was probably 14 or 15 and went out on my first date, I knew the first question I'm going to get is, is she a believer? And that just solved a lot of problems. When I went to my first church and I was pastoring, I was amazed at how many adults were there whose kids had really, oh, they don't go to church anymore. They're apostate. They, they've just apostatized. They don't care about spirituality. What happened? Well, they married an unbeliever. They married a Catholic. They married, you know, that's what happens. And parents, you need to train up the child right. And, um, and that's so important. And I remember as a kid, uh, going to and when I was in high school at Camp Penile, this was one of David Whitelock's favorite verses to go to when he was working with the high school kids. Is to remind them that that uh, bad that bad friends corrupt good morals, and that you need to be very careful of the people you choose uh, to associate with. So it's. Um, we have values as Christians, and we need to make sure we instill those with our children. Second divine institution is marriage. In Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them, that is Adam and Eve, blessed them and told them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This establishes the second divine institution of marriage. Second chapter, he tells us how he created uh, the woman who later was called Eve and brought her uh, to Adam. And when we get to Genesis 9-1, he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It's hard to be fruitful and multiply unless you're still continuing the marriage institution. And so it is that, and that was a problem that they had before because of the, even the uh, fallen angels, the text says that they took human women as their wives. They were following the divine institution of family. So then we come back to uh, the third divine institution, which is family. Because of sin, families have a lot of problems. The way to handle most of those problems is that parents should have matured in the Word and have self-discipline. Today we have too many parents who don't have self-discipline, and they're still trying to fulfill whatever fantasies they had when they were adolescents. They've never really matured, and so they, um, they need to grow up and you have to do that when you have um, when you have children. Before the flood, you had sinful man. This is the theme that runs all the way through Scripture. It is how sinful man is. Then there's global flood, and all of these sinful men died. And then after the flood, only Noah's family was left. But guess what? They are all still sinners. And so when they had babies, they were sinners, and this continued to multiply. And so we get to an example of that to demonstrate 
that mankind was still sinful, even someone who was as obedient to the Lord as, as Noah. And so Noah got involved as a farmer with viticulture, that is the growing of grapes, and uh, you had to know a lot. When you're going to grow grapes and you're going to make wine, you have to know a lot about the soil, you have to know a lot about climate, you have to know about the different kinds of grapes and weather, timing of the rain, fermentation, all kinds of uh, different things. And so he became, became a farmer, and he knew a lot of this. I think the wealth of knowledge that was available in the uh, antediluvian world, that is the pre-flood world, was phenomenal. And Noah and his sons and their wives brought that knowledge with them across the divide of the flood. And so they began to do all kinds of things. And because they were so technologically adept, and they lived for another three or four or five hundred years, uh, and the succeeding generations didn't live that long, they thought they were thought of as gods because they were uh, they just could do everything. But there were problems. Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard and then he drank of the wine and was drunk. And so he's just fall down drunk and he goes into his tent and he's trying to take his clothes off and go to bed and he just falls down on, on the ground. And a result of that was that Ham who is the father of Canaan, that point is made. It's not just Ham that's the problem, it's that he's the father of Canaan. Now when did Moses write this? About 1404 B.C. A little bit before, he probably worked on it while they're going through the desert. But that's when he finalized it. Who's he writing it to? He's writing it to the Jews. What are they about to do? Or as we say in Texas, what are they fixing to do? They, God gives them marching orders that they have to kill every man, woman, and child of the Canaanites. Every single one of them. Well, that's a pretty horrible thing to have to do. And so there were probably a number of them then as now saying, do we really have to do that? And so this is a foreshadowing of why you need to do that because there were certain family traits, let's say, that, that were evident in Canaan, maybe not in Ham, but to some degree in Ham, but, but they were really developed more or seen more in Canaan. And Canaan is going to be the progenitor of the Canaanites. And see, they already have this problem with, with, with sexual perversion. So Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his fathers. And he goes and tells his two brothers. He just has no respect for his father. I don't, some people try to make this into some act of homosexuality or something. And there's nothing in the text to, 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 to really say that. But it shows a tremendous amount of disrespect, and he's just making fun of his father. So Shem and Japheth took a garment. See, see, you, he comes out and he does something, but what they're praised for is tells you what the, what the issue is. They take a garment and they walk in backwards, they don't make fun of their dad, they show respect, and they cover him. So Noah woke up from his wine and knew what his son had done to him. Knew, and, and all it means in the, in the Hebrew is that, that his son had shown him disrespect. And so he, he's a prophet. He prophesies. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he will be to his brethren. Now he goes on and says some things about the descendants of Japheth and the descendants of Shem. Which, which are important. But here we're just emphasizing that, yes, the sin con continued. Now in Psalm 104, uh, 14 and 15, we read that God causes the grass to grow for the cattle. You thought it was the water and the sun. But God is the one who causes. There can be all the right water and sun. God can stop it from growing. So God is involved in 
everything. He takes care of, his, of the planet. Causes grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine that makes glad the heart of man. See, that's a very positive statement. You just, the Bible only prohibits drunkenness, the abuse of alcohol. It doesn't prohibit the use of alcohol. Wine was given to make man's heart glad, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now we'll go through this in more detail when we get to that passage in our study on Sunday morning. But this is in a context where there's a contrast between the, the means of of something, being drunk by means of wine, being filled by means of the Spirit. Now, there, one of the popular deities that was worshipped in Ephesus was Dionysius. Dionysius is the god of wine. And so the priestesses that worshipped with uh, the temple of Dionysius, they would go up into various groves in the hills and the way that they would um, uh, impress the, the deity and hopefully to have the deity come and inhabit their body was to get drunk. Wine was a means of spirituality in Dionysian worship or Bacchus worship. And so that's the contrast. People say, well, control. What's well, not control? The Holy Spirit doesn't control you. You know, how many of us in growing up say, you know, I just don't know why the Holy Spirit isn't controlling me. I still have all these wrong desires, and I'm still acting on these wrong desires. Why isn't the Holy Spirit controlling me? Because it's not about control. It's about being filled with something. Uh, and the means of spirituality is by being filled by means of the Spirit. What's he filling you with? The content isn't mentioned here. It's mentioned in the parallel pa passage in Colossians 3.16. The parallel is to let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. The Spirit of God fills you with something. The something is the word of Christ. The means of spirituality is your walk by the Spirit, Galatians 5.16. Not getting drunk with wine. And so you have to understand the culture, which the Ephesians clearly understood, to, to catch what Paul is really saying here. And, uh, you know, this isn't something I dug out, but there was one of my professors at Dallas Seminary who uh, wrote a fantastic article on it in Bib Sack back in the 70s. And it, it's just great. But you have to understand that, that culture. So it's not a means of spirituality. We're not to get drunk with wine, but we are to be filled by, with the Word, by the Spirit. So the big issue, though, that is being brought out by Moses is that Ham is already showing these perverted instincts of disrespect for authority uh, toward his father. And he's the father of Canaan who took it to the great perversion that is seen by the time the Israelites are going into Canaan. And God is telling, that God gave them, when God made the, we'll get to this, when God made the covenant with Abraham, he said there, that there will be a time that you will be taken as slaves, and you will spend 400 years as slaves, and then I will bring you back, because the time has not been completed for the perversion of the Canaanites. That's, that's my paraphrase. God, what's the principle we're learning? Grace before judgment. God is giving the Canaanites 400 years of grace. And all they do is reject God and reject God and reject God. Finally, God says, well, you have been so bad that you are now a malignant tumor on the body of humanity. And we need to cut you out and destroy you. And that's why God, it, God's love for the rest of the human race is so great that he has to completely annihilate the Canaanites. The trouble is, the Israelites couldn't do it. They went 
to a certain extent, they started off well, did not end well. We read that in Judges chapter 1. And the result of that, their failure to love the rest of the world, loving their neighbors yourself. So let's say you have two neighbors. Neighbor one is a great guy, na- neighbor two is not. Neighbor two hates neighbor one. And neighbor two keeps, keeps mouthing threats that he's going to kill or beat up or assault neighbor one. And then one day he's, he gets so mad at neighbor one that he starts going after, well, if you love neighbor one, you have to protect him and defend his life. That's loving your neighbor. If you say, oh, no, 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 that's okay, you don't want to do this, and you're permissive, and you don't have the guts to shoot the guy where, where he needs to be shot, then you don't love your neighbor. But modern man, modern Americans say, that I love to kill anybody. That's just terrible. Well, then you're making a blasphemous statement about God. You're saying that God was wrong to call for the annihilation of every Canaanite. And you, you, that, that just shows you don't really understand love yet. So the question might be asked, well, is Noah unfair when he announced this curse on uh, Canaan, uh, on Noah, well, Ham? He, really, he doesn't say anything bad or good about Ham. He really doesn't curse Ham. Uh, he curses Canaan, his grandson. So we have Ham's genealogy here. He has four sons, Cush, Egypt, Mitzrayim in most texts, which is the word for Egypt, Put, and Canaan. And the Egyptians, the son of Mitzrayim is Kasluhim, and he's the father of the Philistines, who are just horrible. And Canaan is the father of the Canaanites, Cush is the father of Nimrod, who gives us Babel and later Nineveh. So Ham's descendants are some of the most evil people on the planet. And Babel and Nineveh are located where? Iraq, Iran. And the descendants of the Canaanites are probably located somewhere on the Gaza Strip. But Anyway, so this, this is why uh, the, the curse is on Canaan. They needed to be dealt with. This leads to the fourth divine institution God authorizes. He says in verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood. That's the idiom. Shedding of blood doesn't mean that you, actu- you actually have to shed blood. It's an idiom for violent murder. So if you spike their drink with arsenic or cyanide or something, you're just as guilty of murder and coming under this penalty. It's just a a way of talking about death. So when we talk about the shed blood of Christ, we, we don't understand that's a figurative saying from Hebrew. And it just means death. So every time you see the blood of Christ, that's a biblical idiom for death. And a lot of people just just miss that figurative language and they take things hyper-literally. So whoever sheds man's blood, whoever commits murder, by man his blood shall be shed. Well, how are you going to do that? How How are you going to determine who's guilty and who's not guilty? Well, you have to have government. So what God is doing, he's delegating this responsibility, but man has to develop the uh, the government. It's an authorization for man to govern himself. You didn't have that before the flood. So the result was you have murder with Cain, and he, his, he murdered his brother Abel, and God says, um, uh, does not authorize capital punishment. Instead, God says, you'll be a fugitive and vagabond on the earth. And Cain says, well, my punishment's greater than I can bear. You've driven me out from the face of the ground. And the Lord says, and then uh, Cain said, it'll happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And God said, no, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him. So there was a different standard in the period between Adam and Noah. But after the flood, because there was no human government during that period before the flood, God delegates a responsibility for uh, judgment 
and uh, government. So what we have is the first three uh, divine institutions. We have responsible choice, marriage, and family. These are designed to promote prosperity uh, in the human race. And civil government is to restrain evil, to restrain society. And then when we get to the next divine institution, which, which is nations, then we have the same thing. The nationalism, the establishment of borders, are to prevent criminality. But when you deny borders, then you're going to see rampant criminality, which is what we're beginning to see in this country. So the question that a lot of people will ask, and the one that they present in the curriculum, is would a loving and forgiving God actually install capital punishment? Isn't capital punishment something believers should fight against as it is barbaric, unnecessary, and unjust? Well, as soon as people use words like barbaric, unnecessary, and unjust, that's expressing values of right and wrong. Well, where do you, the question to ask them is, well, where do you get that value? Where, where's your ultimate source for that value? Well, everybody thinks that way. So they're making society the basis for understanding what, what at right and wrong uh, is all about. Psalm 711 tells us we have to start with God, always start with God. God is a righteous judge. So if God tells us to do that, it's righteous. It's authorized. God is a righteous judge and a God who denounces unrighteousness every day. My translation. In Genesis 18.25, as God is telling or getting ready to tell Abraham what he's going to do by wiping out the cities in the plains, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Abraham asks the rhetorical question, shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? Yes, he will. It expects a positive answer. He will do justly. So God is not going to do, tell people to go sin. God is not going to tell people to do something unjust. But because men are sinners, they will do the right thing the wrong way, and it will be unjust. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing it. So God says, I am love. I define what love is. I rescue those I love from evil. And sometimes that means destroying evil people, slaughtering them. That's what needs to take place in Israel right now. And that's what they understand. They, they, I have heard this from many, many sources. It is, the, it is the word that the Israeli government has put out. We are going to go in there, and we are going to dismantle Hamas, and we are going to destroy it so that they cannot ever do anything like this again. But we know that the world is going to push back on that and that it may take two weeks, three weeks. The New York Times on Monday said, well, maybe they're, they're just a little too hasty. So it's already happening. And that's why I said earlier that the message is that we, sh we who are pro-Israel should be communicating with our members of Congress to encourage them to stay the course, support Israel, so that they can rid the planet of Hamas. But you know what's going to happen. We've read, we've read the story of the, what they did with the Canaanites, Judges chapter 1. So here's a little uh, scenario here for thinking through some of the issues. Um, contrast this with how, ma how many nations today deal with theft in, um, in this scenario. So the thief is thrown into jail, which means now he can't, he can't earn a living. See, what, what happens when you look at biblical law and biblical justice is that, I think I have a, let me go here, yeah, I need to do this first. So on the left panel, you see man's justice. You have the man steals, and then he's put in jail. So now he can't restore what he stole to the victim. 
Uh, society pays for everything, pays his court costs, pays for jail time, feeds him, takes care of, gives him better health care than any of us have. And the criminal's family is impacted. But it, it, according to God's justice, if a man steals, then he has to repair, repay it. There wasn't jail. There wasn't this prison system. It was you repay what you stole. If you steal somebody's life, you repay that with your life. It's real simple. You didn't burden the government with a penitentiary system. The problem with our modern penitentiary system is it thinks that the purpose for jail and prison is to... to um, make them better. You know, we're going to correct them. They're going to be better. We're going to teach them how to do, live right. How's that working for us? You know, inside these penitentiaries, it's, it's horrible. They're just, there's, there's schools for making them better criminals. And so you can't reform somebody. That's not the, that's not the goal. The goal of prison is to punish so that it's so bad they won't ever go back again. And to put them to work. And that's the way it used to be. I remember a little boy going out by Sugar Land where they had a prison farm. And you would see them out in the fields working the farm. They were being productive. They were making license plates. They were farming. They would go out and they would pick up trash along the highways. They did work that for the state. And they got paid a certain amount of money. And they could use that to... Uh, do some different things, but it was something that was positive. Now they just have to sit around. They considered work or labor as cruel and unusual punishment. That's what the liberal courts did. So it, eventually God will put an end to evil at the final judgment. It was retributive justice that was uh, proportional. Exodus 21, 23, if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. It's not a, re this isn't a retaliation like, it's not to be taken literally. It was proportional. If you did something that took a certain livelihood away from somebody, then that's what you had to replace it with. So that's what the analogy is. It's not saying that if you poked out somebody's eye that your eye has to be poked out. It wasn't literal. So if there's an offense where somebody's animal is killed or body part injured or a person was killed, then if the animal was killed, it's replaced with a new animal. If a body part is injured, then there was an equivalent amount of money paid to the victim. If a person's killed, then the killer loses his life. Romans 13.1 says that every, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So God appoints those authorities. He's writing this under one of the worst tyrants of the world, which is Nero. So we have to deal with that. But Nero, the, um, the emperor, was the ultimate authority. That's not what it is in this country. In this country, the ultimate authority is supposed to be the Constitution and law. Law rules. We believe in the rule of law, not the re rule of men. So Yahweh says, whoever takes a life must repay with his own life. But human beings say, no, 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 no. I disagree. My personal judgment is better. It's making the same mistakes that Eve made. So you have various arguments against capital punishment. Uh, God told Noah about capital punishment, institutes it, but people say, well, times have changed. Problem is, people haven't changed. Second, second uh, objection is that capital punishment does not discourage evil from occurring. Well, you know, the purpose isn't to discourage evil from occurring. Did you know that? doesn't say that in the text. We'll look at that in a minute. It says you, you, if they, they take another human being's life because that other human being is in the image of God. It's a punishment. You have forfeited your life 
because you took the life, uh, you have committed blasphemy against an image bearer, a divine image bearer. So it's a theological statement. Number 3530, whoever kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the testimony of witnesses. But one witness is not sufficient testimony against a person for the death penalty. Moreover, you shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. It used to be that we understood that it needed to be, uh, justice needed to be applied quickly. But that isn't what happens. Uh, Deuteronomy 17, 6 and 7. Uh, the witness is, the hands of the witness shall be the first against him to put him to death. So there's a, you're, you're invested in this. You're going to tell the truth because you're the one who's going to have to start the execution. And then the objection, it can't be administered fair, fairly. Poor or powerless people can't defend themselves against the rich or the powerful. And that is not, not valid either because it doesn't recognize the fact that you can change uh, some of the situations um, that take place. There's always injustice, and God knew there would probably be injustice, but God said, recognized that it was uh, more important. God understood that men were fallen and corrupt sinners. If we didn't have the unjust application of capital punishment, we wouldn't have salvation. It's not very Christian. Well, yes it is. Acts 25.11 establishes this. And so Paul is taking his case. He totally stays within the law. And when he is not given uh, proper court time, he appealed to Caesar as his right as a uh, Roman citizen. Luke 3.14, uh, the soldiers asked, asked him, saying, what shall we do? So he said to them, don't intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your, your rate wages. That's in a parable. So it is, you know, there's a sense of justice there. Don't, don't destroy that. So we have to understand what we're seeing all the way through this is the ultimate authority has to be the Word of God. When we're looking to our own opinions, our own limited knowledge, then we're, ju we're putting ourselves in authority over God. But the ultimate authority is the Word of God, and the Word of God should shape our understanding of the world. Now in this chart, we have to in examine the origins. Where does our perspective or stand on a particular topic come from? Where do your opinions come from? What are you looking to? Are your feelings, your own logic, and reasoning, someone else's personal experiences? Is it God's Word in the Bible? Articles in the media or people you look up to. It's always got to be, it's God's Word, the Bible. So we have the divine institutions. We have responsible choice. We're to take care of the earth under God's leadership. That's not, that's not environmentalism. Uh, after the fall, we have to struggle with the environment. And human beings seek to assert their authority over God's leadership, and they abuse creation. Man fights, and after the flood, man still continues to fight up against God's leadership. In marriage, it's a loving, designed to be a loving partnership, to multiply and fill the earth. But then there's conflict when sin arises, and so there is difficulty and can lead to uh, abusive marriages. And that is the same after the flood. There's a fight for control. Uh, in the family, train the children. After the fall, if they don't, then it becomes dysfunctional and the family falls apart. And that's where we are today. New York Times was even astute enough to recognize in the 90s that the family was, was past recovery. And so the nation would fall. All right, we'll come back next time. We get into the seventh chapter, which then, uh, the seventh lesson, which then begins to build on, um, on what we've learned so far. We're headed towards what happens at the Tower, Tower of Babel. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things and be reminded of the significance of each of these different events and that we can put them together in our own thinking 
to d- really develop and strengthen our own worldview. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.